glad to see everyone here this morning. And let's turn to Acts chapter 8 and Luke chapter 15. And I like that, uh, that hymn that we heard this morning that was, I Will Fly Away. And that one has some particular meaning to me. It's like I grew up listening to that hymn. And I went to Bible college with some guys that didn't like that. And uh, you know that hymn, we can look at it two ways, that it looks toward the rapture. Or if we pass away before the rapture, that our spirit leaves our body. But the guys I went to school with, most of them were all millennialists, you know. And, and the Bible that tells us that when the rapture comes, we're going to be taken by surprise. But I thought, how surprised are they going to be? You know, it's like, what's happening? You know, it's like. My spirit's leaving my body. Where am I going? You know, because they think we're already in the millennial reign. And they, they think that it's, it's not really a thousand years. So why would it be called the millennial reign, right? They just think it's a long time. But it's called the millennial reign for a reason. Because it will be a thousand years. But that's not what I'm talking about today. Even though I talked about it so much. Let's take a look at Acts and Luke because we're going to see some things about the way God thinks about things as opposed to the way we think about things naturally. So let's look into God's word today. Lord, we thank you, Father. We praise you this morning. Reveal your word to us and your thoughts that we can see that we don't think the way you do, that you have an economy that works so differently from ours, that you have reasoning that defies our reasoning. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting because on Thanksgiving Day, I was speaking with Sam's mom, and we had a very interesting conversation. And we were think, think, talking a little bit about the way that God thinks of things. And the, uh, the subject of the 11th hour workers, the parable of the 11th hour workers came up. And if you know the story there that the owner of the vineyard, he goes out and he finds people at the first hour of the day, finds people not working. He hires them, brings them to work on it for a agreed amount. He goes out multiple times and finally at the 11th hour with only one hour to go, he hires people and brings them in. But when he pays them, he pays everyone the same amount. And of course, the 11th hour workers are very happy with this. And the first hour workers were not happy about it. Because they see, we sh they're thinking we should get more. We should get more. That's the way we think. That is not fair. Right? Ever heard anybody say that? That's not fair. But the reality is, is God's grace is not fair. It's not based on fair. It's because no one, no worker, is earning anything from the Lord. Everything is freely given. And we have priorities that are what we would call natural to us. And Jesus presents some things that defy our natural thinking. He has values that are different than the values that we see. And we see Philip. And Philip, he was a man of God. And God calls him out to minister to one person. One person, that was it. On this, all the way out in the desert. And Philip was obedient. Do we think like that in our churches? Churches are usually measured by the number of people that show up. How many people do you have in your church? And it doesn't matter if you had a thousand people that were unsaved coming to your church or you had a church that had one or two people that were born again. We would naturally look on it as the church that has a thousand people is successful. And the church with one, two, three being unsuccessful. 
And it's interesting because I'll not name names, but there was a situation I was in that we were going to do a, a meeting where we would sing and preach for people at a certain place. And we showed up, and this was years and years ago, we showed up to the place and our leader was very put out because there was hardly any people there. There was maybe 10 or 15 people. And he said, I don't think we should do this. There's hardly anyone here. And I found myself being ashamed of being associated with that ministry. And I always thought, when I thought of that, of Philip being willing to go to minister to one person that was not even a Jew. He was not even from their country, but he was Ethiopian. And then Jesus presents a parable of the 90 and 9. It's recorded two times in Luke and in Matthew. Talking about leaving the 90 and 9 sheep to go after the one. And you know what? The one was probably a problem sheep. Have you ever seen that little video that it was circulating, circulating on Facebook a while back of the sheep and it's stuck in this crack in this big ditch and the guy's like, he's helping the sheep out and he pulls the sheep out, he gets it by the hind leg and he drags it out of there and releases it. And it takes off and it runs as fast as it can to get away from him. And about 20 yards further down, it falls right in the same ditch again and gets wedged again. After he has just rescued it. That's the kind of sheep that wanders off. It's like 99 of them will stay with the shepherd. But then there's always that one. And he's a problem sheep. So I wanted to think about this because Jesus gives a high priority to that problem sheep and gives it more attention and doesn't just release it. Can you imagine if you called and you could think of me as like the pastor of this little church here. If I called one of the TV evangelists or the mega church pastors and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, with having a mega church or being a t televangelist or whatever. Many of them do a very good job. But can you imagine that if I called one up and I said, hey, I've got one person here that really, I would like for you to come and minister to this one person. Come to a Sunday morning here and minister to this person that is coming to my church. They're an important person. And they're hungry. They're hungry to know the word. And many of these, these people are professionals in the sense that they are Christian entertainers more than pastors. And they have a set amount that they charge. Okay, well, you know, for, the, for Sunday morning, we charge $15,000 or whatever, you know. And they'll give you the amount that they charge for that. Some of them would come, maybe. I don't know, but I would say that to minister to one person, we don't have the proper view or value. There was a pastor who pastored a small church. I mean, I call it a small church. It was about 100 people. And they asked him, he said, what do you think of the megachurches? He said, it's great that they minister to so many people. And he had such an innocence in the way he saw it. He said, it's amazing because he said, I work so many hours a week to minister individually to the people of my church. He said, I try to be there to weep with them when they weep and to rejoice with them when they rejoice and to love them individually and know their names. He said, I don't know how someone who has a 5,000 member church does that. And obviously they can't, but they have people that they have staff. But what a personal touch we have when we touch 
people the way that Jesus did. He did minister to the thousands. But what did he say after he fed the thousands and they followed him? You follow me for the fish and for the bread. But not for that personal touch. And in Acts 8, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandeth thou what you readest? Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And how many times do we hear people say, You know, I read the Bible, but I really don't understand. I really don't understand. And interestingly enough, Philip ministered to this person. And they say that there is still a line of churches in Ethiopia that descended from this ministry of Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. And I've thought, what if we had ministered that day that we refused to minister to the people because there were just a few? Maybe there was one person that would have began a ministry or ministered to others. We don't know till we get to heaven and we see the rewards of just taking the time. And it's not just for pastors or musicians, but it's when we as individuals, as we carry that great commission within us and we reach as Jesus does and we touch that lost sheep. How can I know except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were coming up of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azatos, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I find this really interesting because I can say it's been more the type of ministry that I've had. Because every pastor, when you think of becoming a pastor, you think if we have a church, people will just flock in. And my ministry will be like Reinhard Bonnke where you will just see people flocking to the elders or I'll be the next Billy Graham. And we think like that. We have this, I will do so well. But I will say that many more people are one, one at a time. And I can say that it's been my experience as I've ministered to people individually, one person, and I shared the gospel. And they would receive and listen. 
and when that anointing is there. And I recently prayed with someone and I said, do you believe? And he said, I believe, but I have doubts. And I said, well, you know, pray. And he says, I don't know how to pray. And so I prayed with him and he received Christ. And he hungered for the word just like this Ethiopian eunuch. And it's interesting that we so do not value this type of ministry as it should. How important this is. The one lost sheep. And then in Luke 15, 1 through 7. And this is the parable of the lost sheep. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. To listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured saying, This man receives sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not have, leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. It's interesting, you know, the philosophy of this. The lost sheep, the Pharisees and scribes, Religious people knew the prophecies, took the stand against idolatry, believed they were doing the work of the Lord. But when Jesus was reaching out and touching the lost sheep, they murmured against him. And I can tell you we can expect the same as we minister to those who are lost. Why? Because... They are in bondage. Why do we say that they are lost? It's interesting. Yogi Berra, me and Bill know who he is. I don't know if anybody else. We're, we're the old people. He had the yogiisms that he always said. And uh, he, was, uh, he was famous for things like, uh, it's, it ain't over till it's over. I think that was one of his sayings. Um, people don't go there anymore because it's too crowded. Interesting. Um, but he had a saying, objects are lost. Because people look for them where they're not instead of where they are. That's pretty profound, isn't it? Isn't that true? We can be like that. That we spend our time only in churches where their lost people are not likely to be. But we don't look for them where they are. We look to, for them where they are not. And it's interesting to see the criticism that Jesus received. Because he was looking for the lost where they are. And we must look for them where they are. And not just in a physical sense. We must see them where they are and that they have no life in them. As Chris taught, when Lazarus came from the grave, he had the grave clothes on. He smelled bad. We can't be offended by that. We can't be surprised that dead people are dead. That they have grave clothes. But we can't become dead to win them to life. It's interesting because I remember when I was going to God's Bible school as a teenager. And it was a long, long, long time ago. And b believe it or not, it was way back in the time when there were still the Jesus people were out there. And they were what we would call, refer to as hippies, you know, with their, their flowers and beads and long hair and sandals and, and that type of thing. Well, we befriended, me and some guys from the school I went to, befriended some of the Jesus guys. But I, I don't know what became of them, but one shared with me. He said, you know, where I was living, and, I, and this was profound because I don't even remember the guy's name, but I remember him sharing. This. He said, where I was living, there was a guy that lived upstairs for me, that had a serious drug problem. And he said, I really wanted to live, to, to win him for Christ. 
And he said, so instead of presenting the gospel to him, he said, I identified with him. I built up a rapport with him. He said, I did his drugs with him and I did everything else and I wanted to come and him to think we were coming to this great realization together. And he said at the end of it, he said, I realized something that I had not won him, but that he had won me. And now he had a drug addiction to overcome and never won the guy. But we must bring people forth from the grave. The guy that found the sheep that he had lost, the shepherd, he put it on his shoulders and carried it back home. Because of the love, we can't be offended by the grave clothes, by the baggage that someone that carries. We can't expect them to clean themselves up. So Jesus brings this parable. What do we mean a parable? A heavenly story or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning? That's very true. Parable means what? means what literally it means to lay side by side. We have a story to help us understand that we lay side by side with the things that actually happen, that we will know, we will be able to identify and understand. And in Matthew 18, 12 through 14, we see the same parable, and it's repeated twice. And it, the theme is about God's saving grace and God's keeping grace. There's a series of three parables here that are laid out. And it's the lost coin representing the lost that are in the house, in the church that are lost. And the woman of the house sweeps until she finds that lost coin and rejoices over the one Lost coin, even though she had nine more. And we see the lost sheep. And then the prodigal son. The lost sheep being one lost in the world. The prodigal son being one who was born again, but has wandered away. But it's interesting that the Pharisees said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. But when we look at the heart of the shepherd, that we notice that the shepherd knew precisely how many sheep that he had. He knew how many sheep were in his flock. If I had 100 sheep and I was missing one, realistically, I probably wouldn't notice until it came the day to count them, hey, there's only 99 here. I wonder which one is missing. If I had a church of 10,000 and one was missing, would I notice that one was lost? If it was even a church of 100. But this shepherd precisely knew how many were in his flock. The writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs 27, 23 says, Know well the condition of your flocks. Know well the condition of your flocks. If the Lord's only give you, given you one person to minister to, or five, or ten, or a hundred, that we make ourselves available to minister to them and to know their condition make ourselves available to listen when they speak and to know what's on their hearts. It's interesting, I took a class years ago. It was listening for heaven's sake. And from biblical, listening from biblical perspective was this, that the greatest expression of love that we can give to someone is to listen to their hurts as they speak and they share them. Because if we don't care enough to listen, they're not going to trust us beyond that. Know the condition of our flocks. 
Know the condition. In the Bible, God continually compares all of mankind to sheep. And why do you think that is? It's because we think that we're self-reliant and that we can fend for ourselves and we don't realize that we are very susceptible for, to falling prey to the wiles of the devil. You see, no one ever sets out to say, oh, you know, I think that I'll let Satan ravage my life in this way or that way. You don't start out thinking that way until we're there and we think, how did we get here? We're vulnerable. We are in need of protection from the evil one. It's interesting because if you watch the news, many, many, many times you hear of people who get lost hiking. You think, how do you get lost just walking in the woods, walking on a trail? And then the next thing you know, somebody doesn't know where they, where they are. And it's because when darkness sets in many times, things look very different. They start out with the sun here and they are far away from where they started and the sun is in a different place. And there was a man who sh shared his experience of getting lost. And he said, as the sun was beginning to go down, he said, I realized nothing looked the same. And fortunately for him, being an experienced hiker, he found some shelter and he spent the night there. And when the sun came up the next morning, it was very clear his way to find his way back. And it's that way with us, that if we will make ourselves available to the light and wait on the light to guide us, that the word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path and the light of Jesus Christ shines us the way. And we know that the good shepherd, he seeks his lost sheep. He protects his sheep. And Jesus continued this parable by saying, does not he leave the 90 and 9 and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? It's an interesting question because what would I do? I would say, well, you know what? I might have to look for the sheep for days. I'd be better off if I just let the wolves have him because it's not I've got 99 more. So why do I need to worry about this one? But we can have comfort in knowing that the good shepherd always seeks his sheep and protects his sheep. Does he not leave the 99 and go after the one? You see, it's what we would call, by natural reasoning, it's the law of diminishing returns, right? After all, what's the value of one sheep compared to the total of 99? And if we think this way, and I've met people that think this way, we can feel like we are lost in the numbers. Does God really care about me? There are millions of people in this world does God really even know that I exist or care that I exist? We think about this in a lot of ways. We're told that we should go vote and, and make our voice known through voting. Many, many times I hear people say, well, I'm only one. What does that count for? We can feel that way about God. But we can know that he values each and every one of his sheep. That he values the one just as much as the 99. Such a scenario as this, it defies human logic and common sense. But this is in God's economy. Who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Speaking on the Lord's behalf, Ezekiel writes this. He said, my flock wandered through all the mountains and on every hill. And my flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth. 
and there was no one to search or to seek for them. In Ezekiel 34, 6. And see, in Ezekiel's day, God charged the religious leaders with spiritual oversight of God's people. And they had failed to watch over them. They had not been faithful to their sacred oath. And the Lord rebuked these leaders saying this. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. And this could be applied to this very day. To pastors and Christians who think only of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the loss. So they were scattered because there, were no, there was no shepherd. Ezekiel 32, 2, or 34, 2 and 32, 34, 4. But the good shepherd is not like this. You see, paid hirelings, he says, the hireling will flee. He'll run away at the first sign of danger because he has no vested interest in the sheep. There is no love there. There is no relationship there. He doesn't know their names, but he knows our names. Our names are inscribed on the hands of God. This parable, we would look at this and Say, well, this is talking about our tendency to wander away from God. And it does touch on that. But the real point of this is this. It has much more to say about the character of God. His love for us. One other comforting thing is that not only does he seek his sheep, but the good shepherd always finds his lost sheep. Am I saying that everyone will be saved? No. But I'm saying that if you are a sheep and you're wandering and seeking, he will find you. He pursues us with an everlasting love until we are found. It's interesting. I remember a few years ago at convention at GGWO in Baltimore that we left the chapel and we went to, uh, we went out to eat. And when we came back for the next service, I realized I had left my Bible laying in the chapel. And I went and walked all the seats and I saw a few other Bibles there, but mine was not there. And then I found out they had a lost and found. And I went to the lost and found and there was my Bible that I had left laying there. And I really realized, you know, it is a comfort to know that I could leave something there and that it will be found. That assurance that it will be found. And that's the assurance that we can have in Christ. That knows that, or I know that I am secure. That I am found. There is a safe place where I am kept. In Christ. And it's an amazing thing. Is the hymn that. Is the hymn. Says I was once lost. I once was lost. But now I am found. Was blind. But now I see. That's amazing. It's an amazing thing that I can be lost. Me alone. Only me. But I have such a value. That his amazing grace will seek me until I'm found. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you. The writer of this hymn, Amazing Grace, had such a revelation of you as the good shepherd. And Lord, we thank you that this is shared with us. In Jesus' name, amen.